put that into the category of what draws you to the theater. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> vodka and caviar. You heard it first. <laughs> <laughs> Don't that vodka and caviar, and we'll just pull it into the world. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. And the reviews still suck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that most American critics could do that and remain brutal. <laughs> no. Too nice. Yeah. <laughs> Brutality is a virtue. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, what, I have to echo what Harvey said. And by the way, when you were talking about mentoring and who do we, when I started reviewing, just when John called me from stage and cinema, I read all of Harvey's reviews because I want to aspire to that kind of writing. As a result, it actually takes me a lot longer to write some of the reviews. Uh, but I, I think that the, the goal is going to be for me as an artist to realize that I'm actually creating more since I stopped getting paid. I'm actually stronger in my clarity of what I'm seeing because I can't consume as much. I, you know, when I've cut out cable and eating out and all of that stuff, I actually, I know it sounds strange, but I find I'm actually able to eloquently articulate what I'm experiencing on a level that I don't do when I'm over consuming. And so I find that artists that are looking for money or for fame, and that's the priority, maybe we should go back to the model of creating theater because that's what sustains us. See, I don't have any problem with the, con with the proposition that if you are not paid, it keeps you honest. I have problems when people switch it and say, if you're honest, it means you are unpaid. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> being, being unpaid, maybe, being unpaid <laughs> is, is, is not in and of itself a guarantee of honesty. Right. No. It may be just a guarantee of license to, to blather. <laughs> um, I, think, I think the people who should respond to this are the readers. If you demand accuracy in facts and precision in language, a background in the, in the history and craft of the theaters we've been talking about, a certain amount of re readability, and then enough humility to know that your review is not curing cancer, and a show you, a show you didn't like isn't causing cancer, if you have that, if you have, if you, the readers will demand those traits in who they read. And I don't think it matters a damn whether you're being paid or not if you bring those characteristics to the work. So this whole idea, I'm somehow pure and I'm gonna be honest, I don't know if that's what was intended, but I, think, I, don't, think that's, I don't think that's right at all. I don't think you're, you're I, I think you have to look to the work, to, to the respect in the writing, and then the paid or unpaid becomes a matter of, gee, he writes that well and he's not getting paid? That's a shame, that's not right, which I can totally have sympathy for. Wow, that, that, that woman really writes well. She should be paid. I agree with that. But I, I think, I, think I, I just don't cotton to that idea of the money and the, possibly because I'm paid. But <laughs> <laughs> not a lot. Not a lot. <laughs> so, anyway. Okay. Let's continue onward. Um, I don't know how many of you or how many of our audience were able to catch the panel that, that occurred this Monday at KPCC. That was really a great conversation there. Um, but one of the things that was said was that LA theater is arguably still an adolescent in comparison to New York and Chicago in terms of our theatrical development. We you know, were founded at a later date and now are still technically in an adolescent phase. Now, presuming that that statement is true, um, I'd like to know as some of the town's most active theater goers, what characteristics do you hope LA artists will carry with them into maturity? And what assets do you think we need to grow out of? Take a second. We have to start to have to accept your premise, and I'm not sure that I do. Yes, okay. Um, we can argue that. We don't, we don't have a New York model. We don't, we don't have a history of theater growing up from a single community, which was the Jewish community on the Lower East Side, and then moving into 14th Street, the theaters there, the Minsky's and stuff, and then finally uptown, and this huge influx of interest from a single culture for the, that really gave birth to the whole commercial theater. We don't have that, but we have some extraordinary theater in this town. I don't know why and anyone would call it adolescent, um. but that, that we don't have a, a direct path from here to the Winter Garden, 
certainly that's true, but that's not really that true in New York either anymore. There's too many revivals, there's too many um, producer shows, Disney shows, Lion Kings and things like that that are filling the great houses. And I think what's going on like off-Broadway or off-off-Broadway is not completely, uh, it's not radically better than what we have going on here in a lot of respects. I would say that it's adolescent in the sense that very few people here can make a living from their work in the theater. I would like to see that change. Mm -hmm. okay. I, and it was Mark of LA Stage Alliance that, that kind of brought that topic up as an argument that we're still building the infrastructure. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That was kind I of that where that came from. The infrastructure, you know, we just don't, we don't have the middle you know, theaters and that. Adolescents, you know, they're growing at strange rates and they're awkward and cumbersome and stuff. I'm not <laughs> sure that if you, if you tried to create a Broadway in New York right now from scratch, you could. I don't think you could. I don't think you could. Well, I, I think it's, but I also, I, I, I agree with you that I think that LA has its own unique sort of, I don't even know what it is yet. I think it's still evolving. So I, I don't think you would want to model the infrastructure on New York or, or Chicago. I think it, it needs to be something, I, actually I think we're at an opportunity, I think we're at a tipping point literally in Los Angeles theater where we can create our own new kind of infrastructure that markets it like no one's ever seen before. And uh, I think, but we do, I, I agree with Donnie, do, we do have to create some sort of professionalism around all the institutions, around the criticism institutions and the producers, and you know, it, it just needs to be a little bit tighter. And Steven, I think you were itching to add something there. No, yeah, I was thinking about New York, and in the, say, early 90s, whatever, New York, was, didn't have that infrastructure either as much, and now it does. Has terrific infrastructure, has more institutions than any other theater city probably, certainly in the country, if not beyond. Um, but what it doesn't have anymore, perhaps as a consequence of all these institutions, is opportunity. And I think that's what we do have. And I would almost regret too much infrastructure if it's going to be at the cost yeah. of the openness that, our, that this city provides. Um, and, and that you may be calling adolescence, but I, th that word comes with a certain judgment to it that okay. I'm not sure is, is, is the right judgment. The other thing, pu putting this in a, in a larger picture, we are very much tied to the, the economic forces you know, in, the, in, the, in the atmosphere. <clears throat> and since, probably for, yeah, for, since really 1980s, there seems to have been an assault the, uh, on, th on three major factors of the culture that we're now seeing and we're paying for, and it's not just theater. It's just, you, you know, you, it's hard to make a living in the theater. It's getting harder for anybody to make a living anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. One of those is it, we've seen an assault on labor, which is a direct consequence of why those of us who still are getting paid are getting paid less, and those of us who want to get paid aren't getting paid at all. You can see that in New Jersey right now where there's, you know, the, the, uh, and the Walmart Supreme Court decisions. These are, these are patterns. There seems to be an assault on labor. There seems to be an assault on education, which is very clear in California and, and around the country. And there's an assault on the arts. Those are the three. And we're in this together. And this is the, the shifting tectonic place that we're all going to have to live with to keep the art form go going. So I think what we really need to consider is how we counter those seeming like overwhelming challenges together and keep this art form relevant and keep it addressing those very issues and those factors that I, are shutting down. I have, uh, I have one thing I'll, I'll just throw in the mix. I think if there's anything adolescent about LA theater, it's a, not universal, because we all can think of exceptions, but there's kind of a, an adolescent approach to the business of theater. Um, one of our one of our colleagues keeps writing that uh, what the theater in LA needs is better directors, more adventurous directors. I think we need more adventurous and better producers. I agree. Because the producers are, the producers are the ones who decide what gets on. You know, there's this this fallacy: the producers are the money people. Somebody's got to get the money together. It can't all just be for the art. And the producers.